play, folks, so we'll try to do better. <coughs> okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, November 17th. For those who will be following in the archives, we will not meet on November 24th or December 1st, so we're going to go all the way to December 8th before you look for a new class on the archives, and stay tuned about December 15th. Come join us for Hanukkah on December 4th. If you are in the San Bernardino Highland area, you can text, call, get a hold of us. We'll get details to you. With all that out of the way, I know we're anxious to get back to Genesis. We're in the midst of God's amazing creation. Is it not amazing? But on our way back to Genesis, I'm going to take us through a little sidestep into Psalm, Tehillim Psalm 20, I'm sorry, 33. <laughs> 23 is so common that that just came off my lips easily, but it's Psalm 33. I just want to read it for you, and I think you'll understand why, but this also tells us that God is taking what we're reading and studying in Genesis as historical fact. He's not leaving it up for question. Rejoice in Adonai, that's in the Lord. You righteous, praise is well suited to the upright. Give thanks to Adonai the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a ten-stringed harp. Sing to him a new song. Make music at your best among shouts of joy. I think they put that in there for people like me who can't carry a tune. I can shout for joy. <laughs> for the word of Adonai is true, and all his work is trustworthy. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the grace of Adonai. By the word of Adonai, the heavens were made and their whole host by a breath from his mouth. He collects the sea waters in a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear Adonai. Let all living in the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke, and there it was. He commanded, and there it stood. Do you hear Genesis all over this psalm? Yes. Adonai brings to nothing the plans of nations. He foils the plans of the peoples but the counsel of Adonai stands forever. His heart's plans are for all generations. How blessed is the nation whose God is Adonai, the people he chose as his heritage. Adonai looks out from heaven. He sees every human being. From the place where he lives, he watches every living, everyone living on earth. He who fashioned the hearts of them all and understands all they do. A king is not saved by the size of his army, a strong man not delivered by his great strength. To rely on a horse for safety is vain, nor does its great power assure escape. But Adonai's eyes watch over those who fear him, over those who wait for his grace, to rescue them from death and to keep them alive in famine. We are waiting for Adonai. He is our help and shield. For in him our hearts rejoice because we trust in his holy name, May your mercy, Adonai, be over us, because we put our hope in you. I hope that blesses you as much as it did me when I read it this week. When all of that just popped out, I saw the God who created has his eye on every one of us, knows our needs, and meeting our needs. Whether we're in famine or in blessing, there really <coughs> is no want in the Lord. He is our Savior and our Redeemer, not just our Creator. Loretta? I can also read 34. 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Amen. Thank you. Good end to it. Oh, me. And I couldn't see it on my screen, so I'm glad you had it on your screen. With that in mind, we'll go back to Genesis 1. We're not going to do a long review at all. We're only down to verse 3. We actually finished verse 3, but I want to just bring back to our remembrance a little bit on verse 3. We'll start with, uh, well, let me tell you, in the beginning we know God made everything. We talked about how he made it perfect and how it became without form and void. And now we're talking about the recreation or the restoration as the Spirit of God moved over the waters. We saw that, that uh, well, we saw, uh, yeah, as he moved over the waters, we saw that there's motion, there's energy, there's something happening. We saw that in verse 3 that God said, let there be light. And this was not the making of our sun. This was bringing light. Probably light waves were starting to be pointed in a direction toward what we call earth. 
because we have uh, the light separating the light from the darkness. We know God is light, so it's it's not that it's where God is and where he isn't, or we'd have to say God's missing every night. <laughs> it's not that. And even though it's not talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars, it is still talking about light that came in, and apparently because the earth was already turning on its axis, and we're going to see that as we continue our study, that there would be times when the earth was toward the light waves that were coming, and that gave light, and then when the earth would keep turning away from that, then there would be the darkness, because again, we don't have the sun, and we don't have the moon yet. Those are coming. That's why I wanted to remind you of um, verse 3 before we went further today and caused confusion. The Hebrew from here tells us this was not a new, out-of-nothing creative act. The idea was he made the light to appear, or he made it become visible. God speaking would, it, it would be creating energy, because when he speaks, goes forth and happens. That that's, produces energy. God is light. So the energy, it, it would stand to reason that it be light. And we talked about how this earth began then with this light before there's a sun. And in the uh, way out, Revelation 21, 22, going into eternity, we see, again, no sun, but the light continues on because the light is the Lord himself. Okay, so with all of that there, we started into verse 4 last time that God saw the light was good separated the light from the darkness. I guess we did all, we, yes, we did do all of verse 4 too. I, I stand corrected. We got all the way through verse 4. Again, apparently God spoke light waves into the earth. As it turned, it, there would be light, there would be darkness. But we'll see the, more of a formation coming very quickly here because in verse 5, where we are picking up now, God called the light day. This was to distinguish it from the darkness. Okay, he's making something very clear here. So he called the light day and the darkness he called night. Again, not because there's a moon and because there's a sun in the absence of one of them, but because there's light and there's darkness. So he called the light day, he called the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning one day. Okay, when he called the light day and distinguished it from the darkness, we need to know, or we want to know, I maybe I should say, what kind of day are we talking about? Because you will hear different theories out there. There's four different ways we see day referred to in Scripture. The first way is that it's talking about 24 hours of light, that a, a solar day, I'll put it that way. Um, look with me at Yochanan, John 11 and verse 9. John 11 and verse 9. And those of you who have the cross-references, that's down in it. This is going to talk about a 12-hour day. So actually, when I said solar day, it's not 24 hours of light. But a solar day, we have these 12-hour periods. We round it off that way. John 11 and verse 9 says, Yeshua Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. Okay, so he was just drawing on a fact. We'll talk about that in general, just dividing the day 12 hours and 12 hours, so day and night. That's one way that day is used in Scripture. Then it is used as a period of 24 hours, where it's not talking about daylight and night time. It's talking about a 24-hour period. We see it used in our original covenant, you call the Old Testament, probably something like over 100 times in this manner. But I'm going to give you one example in the New Covenant because you're closer to that right now. Back up from John to, uh, oops, to Matthew. <laughs> I've got to get my fingers to do right on my tablet. It's a little hard on the angle of this. Um, I'm going to have to do something better. There we go. Okay, Matthew 17 and verse 1. And we read in Matthew 17, verse 1, Six days later, Yeshua Jesus took with him Kepha and Yaakov, James, Peter and James, and Yochanan, John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. This is talking about 24-hour periods. If I said six days ago, I'd be talking about last Tuesday, Wednesday to Wednesday being the week. Okay, so we're talking about periods of 24 hours. We're talking about six days the same way when he referred to it, you could mark off six days on your calendar. 
okay? Third way the scripture uses the word day is talking about a specific time set apart for a purpose. It's now no longer meaning 12 hours or 24 hours. It's not meaning one day, but it's talking in a con complete, what do I call it? Um, <laughs> I'm needing better words than my little vocabulary here. Um, a period of time. Okay, it's talking about a period of time. Let me give you an example early on in Scripture. I'll take you back because we'll head back. Actually, we're going to go back and forth. If you don't want to go back and forth, just stay tight and I'll read it for you. But this time we're going to Leviticus. In my Hebrew, it's Viacra. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 27. This is going to speak to us about the Day of Atonement. Now, we do know that there is one day on the calendar marked as the Day of Atonement, but it's a day set aside for a specific purpose, and it doesn't necessarily have to be 24 hours. The Day of Atonement does happen to be. Leviticus 23 and verse 27 says, On exactly the tenth day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall humble yourselves and present an offering by fire to the Lord. But if you talk to a Jewish person about the time of the Day of Atonement, you're going to be talking to them about the high holy days. And in their mind, you're talking about at least a 10-day period from Rosh Hashanah to the Day of Atonement to Yom Kippur is a 10-day spread, and yet they'll call that time the Day of Atonement, getting ready for it and going through it. Um, to see it in, in longer periods of time, we often hear, and uh, I'll come to it in a minute. Let me give you one closer, okay? We know... I'm trying to decide which way to take you. All right. God sometimes uses longer periods to accomplish something that he, that's given a name. The day of. All right? Or the day again. Let me take you the easier way is to show you. Let's go back to John, to Yochanan, John chapter 8 and verse 56. Then we'll talk about what it means. But I think if I read the scripture first, I won't confuse you all. John 8, 56 says, Your father, Abraham, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day. Sorry. I've got to find a better way because I'm losing my place. There we go. Rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, how did Abraham see his day? Was Abraham alive when Yeshua, Jesus, was walking on earth and saw him one day and said, Aha, I see his day. We know that's not the way it was. But those of you who went with me through it know that Abraham saw the gospel in the stars. That God laid out the whole plan of redemption from the stars. And Abraham rejoiced in seeing that day coming when atonement would be given for their sins. Their sins would be washed away and they could have resurrected life. Okay, it was counted to him for righteousness. You don't get righteous by being told you're going to have a big family. There was more meaning to it than just that. But he called it his day, that Abraham saw his day. Obviously, it culminates in the day of crucifixion, but if you stopped on the day of crucifixion and you left out the resurrection, you've only got half the story. So obviously there it takes more time than a day, but it's referring to his day, referring to the day of salvation that the Lord um, brought salvation to be an actual fact for us. Look also now at 2 Peter, 2 Kepha chapter 3, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Wow, that's a lot to happen in one day. But is, does it mean one day? And any of you who are educated in study and in scriptures and prophecy know the day of the Lord is a lot longer than one day. The day of the Lord includes the tribulation time. The day of the Lord starts earlier than tribulation time and goes after tribulation time. Some even have it include the millennial kingdom. So it is a long period of time, regardless of where you start and you end. It's very obviously a period of time, not a 24-hour day. Yes, ma'am. There's a song, one day is worth is a thousand years. Yeah. Scripture so, also tells us that, that yeah, in so God's one, eyes. One day a thousand years. In God's eyes, yes. One day is like a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. 
And if you know that old joke that that uh, that the man said to God, you know, is that really true? Is that really how you, you look at it? And, and God was telling him yes. And he said, so then is, you know, a penny like a thousand dollars or a million dollars and a million dollars like a penny and, and God's agreeing with him, okay, yeah, you're getting my idea. Hey God, can I have a penny? <laughs> God says, I'm, sure, give me a minute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> For those of you who didn't get it now, you'll you'll laugh later. <laughs> okay. Back on track though. So we see a day can be a part of a day. We see it can be a 12-hour period. We can see a time set aside for a special purpose given the title, Day of Atonement, so, so forth and so on. Or it can be a longer period of time like the Day of the Lord. We see many different examples of it. So, knowing that, going back to Genesis, we need to know what kind of day is he talking about here. And two main theories, or two main views, let's call them views rather than theories. Two main views that are out there is that one, the day is a 24-hour period, that God put that into motion with what we're, we're seeing as he reveals creation to us. And the second is, no, 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 it's talking about periods of time, geological periods of time, that there had to be much longer periods of time for all to be created that was created, and in that, they would bring themselves room for what they call the evolutionary process. Now, you know long and hard that I do not believe in evolution. There's no evidence to back up evolution. The evidence that they use is false. It's on false premises. And if they're honest and look and study it from the scientific viewpoint of those who are far more brilliant than Rochelle, <laughs> even apart from the word of God, you will see that it cannot hold water. It is a theory at best where creation is substantiated by everything that science has been able to prove. So, which days are we talking about here? I believe fully they were 24-hour days. I believe that it was God putting in motion what is our night and our day, what has come to what we know and understand. But it's not because Rochelle says that, oh, okay, now all you go home and you believe it, because you all know my, you don't believe it because Rochelle says it, you believe it because you can see it in the scripture. But notice the specificness of the Hebrew here. It says, and there was evening and there was morning one day. In Hebrew, that's Arab, that means evening, and it's boker or voker, you can say it with a B or a V, for day. Okay? Israelis still say Arab tov to someone in the evening. Now, they're not wishing them good night for the next thousand years of geologic age. And when my daddy would wake me up in the morning to go to school, he'd wake me up with Boker Tov. And I knew that meant good morning, the day has started. Get up and get going, get dressed, you're going to school today. Not a thousand or a million years from now. <laughs> so I think the evidence of the Hebrew phrase that God spelled out was to show us we've got a day here, we've got a night here, we've got a regular period. So I believe that the evening and the morning are the first day, or day one, as it says here. I believe that we've got a, a, a marked period of time. And I see scripture use that so that I'm not going against anything in scripture either. Uh, last scripture I'll read for you is <coughs> Psalm 90 and verse 6. Psalm 90 and verse 6. And it says, in the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Oh, I guess I've got to back up. The end of verse 5. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. So the grass is coming up. We see that. If you've ever planted seed, you watch it. One day you see it coming up. Now verse, verse uh, 6. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. We're marking time. We're marking time. Obviously, there's not a 24-hour period because the grass that grows and pops, sprouts new in the morning isn't gone that evening. But it's giving us a period of time. Here, I believe that we're again seeing what we'll call the solar day, the 24-hour day. And the Jewish people have marked the calendar in this manner ever since they began marking time, as far as I know. Some try to say it was developed later, but I don't see it because I see it all the way back in Scripture. They begin their day at evening. You know that, that if you've been around me long enough, sundown to sundown is the Jewish 24-hour period. Why? I believe because of right here. The evening and the morning 
were the first day. We see that God starts with the dark and he brings <coughs> light into it for mankind. Uh, that's how earth began for man. It's the same way for our salvation, our second life. We're in the dark and God brings us into the light. So I just think it's the, the way that God intended. It's the Jewish way, not meaning that they're above and better, but it's just the way that God had put it into being. The evening and the morning were the first day. And they, wor they uh, worshipped on Shabbat from the evening to the morning. I'm sorry, from the sundown to the sundown. Evening and then morning and all day until sundown again. And they will even look for three stars to be in the sky at night to know that that day has definitely ended and they can be released from keeping the day holy. So I think that we've got it pretty clear. Last clincher of why I don't think it can be geological periods of time or, or even shorter but longer periods of time than a 24-hour day is because if we fast forward through our creation, we get all the way through six days, we know on the seventh day God rested. So if each of those days is longer than 24 hours, then how long is this rest of God's also? Where would that put it when he uses that as the example for us? And I'll take you to understand that into Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. This is giving you a good Jewish mindset because this is how our Jewish people are taught to think. We are given two major reasons for our Shabbat. And it's our relationship with our God. And one of the main reasons is we are to remember he is our creator God. After the children of Israel have been brought out of Egypt, then they're to recall that also. But that, that was about 1445 B.C. And if man is, goes back close to, let's say, 4000 B.C., we're talking round figures, but obviously there have been 3,000 years of days that have been going on. So when we're looking at it, there was a reason for the Shabbat long before the Exodus. And that reason was God put it into motion. He gave the example. He created and then he rested. He told Israel, work six days, rest the seventh day. Now, if those six days, let's say they were 1,000 years long. If they're to work for 6,000 years, then they're to rest for 1,000 years. Well, then we haven't even come to our first Shabbat yet. <laughs> it throws everything off and multitude of other scriptures that will go through your mind. But I think that, that that's indicating a 24-hour period. God brought it into the Shabbat, the 24-hour period we know of as Shabbat. Put that into the commandments to the children of Israel, the first people that he called his people and had that relationship with, based it on creation, saying he is our creator God. I think we can go on to verse 6 and be very confident that we are talking about 24-hour days. Did I miss something? You said there were three reasons to believe that Shabbat, to, to do Shabbat? Two reasons, two main reasons for Shabbat. Oh, two, okay. Two, yes. One which is creator God, that he's their creator. He creator. Okay. Yes, and then the second is to remember that he brought them out of Egypt. Okay. That these are the two that are to reflect on every, every Shabbat. They're to be reflecting on that. Okay? Thank you. Sure. Okay, we will go to verse 6. I think I've given you everything you need through verse 5. Verse 6, then God said, God's speaking again. It's happening. This is action. I love it. You know what? Just before I do verse 6, let me read this to you. Um, it came out of the book on Genesis, Gleanings in Genesis by Pink. Uh, he uses some big words. I'll break a couple down for us. But I love this because it, it just puts it where it's at. He says, marvelously concise is what is found in Genesis 1. A single verse suffices to speak of the original creation of the heavens and the earth. Verse 1. Another verse is all that's needed to describe the awful chaos into which the ruined earth was plunged. And less than 30 verses more tell of the six days' work during which the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Not all the combined skill of the greatest literary geniuses or historians, poets or philosophers this world has ever produced could design a composition which began to equal Genesis 1. And I want us to see that, how marvelous this is. Now, for reconditeness, and because I had to look up that word, I'll give you the definition. 
<laughs> that means it's difficult or impossible for one of ordinary understanding or knowledge to comprehend the quality of being unclear is obtrusive. In other words, this is so huge uh, beyond our understanding. We can't understand, yet is being brought down into a thing. The simplicity of the language, the comprehensiveness of the scope, the terseness of expression, scientific exactitude, and yet the avoidance of all technical terms. In other words, he's making it simple enough for us to understand, but it's amazing in its ability. In the way that Genesis 1 has written it, it is absolutely unrivaled. Nothing can be found in the whole realm of literature which can be compared to it for even a moment. No other books, nothing else written. It stands in a class all by itself. If brevity is the soul of wit, in other words, if wisdom says be short, then brevity is what is recorded in the opening chapter of the Bible. And yet it evidences the divine wisdom of God who inspired it. Contrast this with the labored formula of sciences. And I remember when we learned the, the DNA formula, it was all over the whiteboard. We had chalkboards back in my day. I'm old. <laughs> and it was over part of the second one just to put up that one formula. And you've all seen scientific formulas that are so long, okay? How about the verbose writings of poets who write long poems? Contrast the meaningless cosmogonies of the ancients and the foolish mythologies of the heathen, the uniqueness for this divine account of creation and restoration that appears all at once simply in these few verses. Every line of this opening chapter of what the author called the Holy Writ, the Holy Written Word of God, has stamped on it the autograph of his deity. It takes God to be so complex to create as he has, and yet able to so simplify it that a child can understand it. That's our God. And in his deity, I love it because I see him do that in salvation. Salvation can be complicated to those who need to think of it on complicated terms. Those who are so brilliant that it's got to meet them up there or they, they lose interest. And yet at the same time, literally a little child, a three-year-old, and I stand by and proof, can understand it and accept Jesus into their heart. Is that not awesome? Is that not our God? Is that not Genesis 1? That's how our Bible has begun. Do you all realize the gold mine you have in your hands? Do you realize the gems packed? Where did verse, what, six? Hello. <laughs> Let's keep going because it is so exciting. It is so good. It is so amazing. It is so, and it teaches us about our God. Remember, it doesn't teach us how the heavens go, but how to go to God's heaven. So let's keep reading. Let's see what else he created for us. In verse 6, then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Now, you may have firmament if you've got the old King James, yep, okay? Yeah. you got firmament. We've got one here. Okay. Expanse is the word that's a little closer to the Hebrew. It literally is expands, like expanding, or it's space. Okay, so let there be space in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. That's like a spread out thinness. My mic gave me trouble. Thinness. Can you get that word over the mic? T H I N N E S S. Okay. <coughs> thinness. You know what? Maybe there's only one N. <laughs> I think there's only one N. Nope, there's two ends. There's two ends. Did Rochelle get A's in spelling? We won't answer. <laughs> okay, then this is what I'm trying to say. What I'm getting at is, what are we breathing right now? Is it thick? We'll talk about the air being thick sometimes, but really it isn't the air that's thick. It's what's in the air that's thick when we talk about it being thick. I see Maria's got her, her microscope out, her... her Magnifier out. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Her magnifier just trying to see, okay? 
space has been stretched. The waters have been pushed aside so that there's this thinness, this spreading out, this thinness, this atmosphere is what we're talking about. The whole mass of air that surrounds Earth so that we can breathe, whether we're in Australia or whether we're in the North Pole. It doesn't matter where we are, we've got space around us that was stretched out between the waters. That's what verse uh, 6 is telling us. Now it says... Um, in verse 7, God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. So now we've got water under, we've got water above, and we've got space in between. Okay, remember when we started out with the restoration of our earth, the water's all over the face of the earth, the depth you can't even see because of the deepness of the water. Now that water has begun to be moved. That's the water that's on the earth. We're not talking about it being separated yet. When that water gets separated, we're going to call it something else. I think you all know what, but if you don't, stay tuned. But what we're saying now is that water that's over the earth down here is being separated from water that's up there. So there's got to be something about water up in the heavens, above the firmament. It's not talking about rain because look real quick at Genesis chapter 2. Verses 5 and 6, sneak peek. It says, Now no shrub of the field was yet on the earth, no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. Okay, well we haven't even gotten to this point yet, but we're told there's no rain on the earth. Um, because there was no rain and no man to cultivate the ground, verse 6, a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Now, when we get there, we'll talk about that more in detail. But that tells us on your way back to Genesis 1 that there was no rain, and the first time we read of rain is all the way in Noah's flood. Okay? And Noah didn't live at the same time. Well, he, their lives intersected, but he wasn't back in the beginning with, with Adam. I'll give you his timing when we get there. Okay? What we are being taught, what we're beginning to understand is that there was like a water vapor around in, in the heavens, okay, space in between, but there was like a water vapor, some called a canopy, that was around. It probably was similar to the rings around some of our planets, something like that, okay, so that you've got the water that's in the atmosphere, or above the atmosphere, you've got your space where you're breathing, and then you've got the waters over the earth still, because our earth is still covered in water. Now, what's the point of having water vapor like a canopy around the earth? number of things that it would do. It would make a global greenhouse. It would maintain a uniformly pleasant, probably warm temperature all over the world. You wouldn't have freezing in the north. You wouldn't have burning up at the equator. You've got the same temperature. You've got a constant, and it would be what would make everything grow prolifically. With those uniform air temperatures, you're not going to have great air mass movements. Without great air mass movements, you don't have wind storms. You don't have the Santa Ana's blowing your head off. You don't have the tornadoes and the hurricanes, okay? With no global air circulation, then there couldn't be the possibility of, of rain because rain takes the, the atmospheric unstableness and it takes several other things. I'm, I'm trying not to get ahead of us because it hasn't been created yet. But the only place that could possibly rain would be right over where the waters are. Now right now there's waters over the whole earth, but we're told there's been no rain yet. Later when we've got more of the earth formed, there may have been a possibility of something like rain just right over where the waters were, but that would be the only place. It wouldn't be affecting the lands and affecting the people. So uh, for those like me who don't like to go out and rain, <laughs> This was my con. <coughs> this is my uh, oasis, my, my woo. <laughs> okay, now with no global air circulations, no turbulence, no dust. Dust is formed in the clouds. Nahum, Nahum um, chapter 1 verse 3 tells us the dust of the Lord's feet are the formation of the clouds. So, you don't have dust kicking up, you don't have the clouds catching it, you don't have them being seeded so that they're going to rain. So, the, the water vapor would have kept everything stable 
and it would have brought its own precipitation in a different way, not in a way of rain, but we do read, and we will read later also, but back there in Genesis 2, 5, and 6, that there would have been like a local evaporation, there would have been a condensation. So basically, you'd have dew, and you'd have ground fog. And I love that. I don't like fog. I don't know where you're at, but the, the, one of the worst things to do is drive in fog. And I've had those experiences. You can't see. It, it, it's horrible. Here it's telling us that's not how God made it originally. That's not what his purposes were. Fog would have been a, just bringing a dampness to the earth under the feet. It would have just been local like that. It probably was a day and a night. Dew at one point, fog at another point that just brought that mist, that, that little bit of dampness to the vegetation that would be needed. So you would have lush vegetation worldwide. Again, you'd have it in the North Pole, you'd have it in the South Pole. You wouldn't have ice caps, you wouldn't have barren deserts, you'd have inequality all over. And if you need proof of this, is this why, from the time of Noah's flood, there have been animals found in the Northern Hemisphere, in the area where it's ice and frozen, and they were found in fossil shape with food in their stomachs, and that food was green vegetation. How did they have food in their stomach, green vegetation, when they died at the North Pole? Well, if everything until the time of the flood, the breaking up of the canopy, the breaking up of the, the, from underneath the waters, and we'll study that in depth, but if that caused the change, then that's why easily these animals were living all over the world, not just in certain areas and they had plenty of vegetation to eat, okay? The vapor canopy also would have filtered out the ultraviolet radiations, the cosmic rays, all that contribute to the human and animal life, to their longevity then, because the vapor protected them, to the less life that we see after Noah. Adam, our first man, lived to be 930 years old, bless his heart. Noah didn't live. Uh, he, that I forget how old he was. I shouldn't have brought him up. But I want to say 500, 600 years. Anyway, he lived less, and life continued to get shorter. Today it's 100 years around figures, okay? Because these things take our lives. The upper waters would have provided the reservoir for Noah's flood. It said, it's, science has studied and said the content of the water vapor that would have been present above that would have been that canopy. canopy. If it broke up and rained, and we know that in Noah's day, the rain came, then it would have been enough just from the canopy alone to cover the earth about an inch. But when what's under broke up, the fountains of the deep that broke up and came up, now you've got world flood. So it really fits that there was a canopy up until the time of Noah's flood. Noah, he lived on it for 50 years. I'm going to stand corrected, okay? But he's going to be our last longevity because they will get shorter and shorter and shorter. We've got, um, and we've just studied it, um, Jacob, 137. Oh, goodness, don't quote me on these, but way down, you know. And, and um, I thought Noah's sons were in the 500s. I think they were, you know. Maybe, and maybe they were still having children then, and we don't hear how long they, they lived after. But anyway, take my word for it. Follow the scriptures. Do your homework, and you'll see life length shortening, you know, till it gets down less and less to like today. So, question. Will the canopy be restored in the millennium? There are those who believe that it will. There are those who believe that the millennial earth will be a, like it was in the Garden of Eden. That's why the desert can blossom like a rose, according to, okay, uh, Rochelle's brain is just not there today. Maybe this is it. If it's not, let's look at it anyway. We want to look at Psalm 148, 4, and 6. It's Isaiah 35 that the desert will blossom like the rose, but Psalm 148, verses 4 and 6 say, Praise him highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. 
Let them praise the name of the Lord. Verse 6, he has also established them forever and ever. He's made a decree which will not pass away. So since those waters above the heavens were created forever and ever, that's why some think it'll come back during the millennium. But let me give you a problem with that. And it's not what I believe because of this verse. Go with me to Zechariah, Zechariah, Zechariah. And we're going to go to chapter, and my tablet isn't working again 14, on the slide. Thank you. But I've got to get 14 and verse 17. She's looking on the cross references and she's right on. Zechariah 14, 17 says to us, and this is talking about during... Oh, Psalm 148, verses 4 and 6. Sorry. That's okay. That's why some think it has to come back because it talks about the vapors being there forever. And God can have his vapors out where it's not touching our earth now today. You know, he, he can have them. I have no problem with that, but it's not affecting our earth today. And I don't think it will affect our millennial earth because in Zechariah 14, 17, where it's talking about the millennium, it says, it will be that whichever of the families of the earth, that's the nations of the earth, does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So, in the millennial kingdom, if a nation wants to be blessed with rain so that they have crops, so they can feed their people, they've got to come up and worship the Lord in Jerusalem on the days when, when, the, when it has been um, declared. Three times a year, they're going to need to come up to Jerusalem and worship the Lord where he's sitting on his throne. And yes, that is Jerusalem, comma, Israel. It belongs to, to Israel. It is the eternal capital of Israel. It is undivided, and it is spoken of in Scripture that that is what Jerusalem is to be. Anything against that is against the word of God. So, now you have my reason why I don't think it can happen during the millennium because if you've got the canopy, everybody would be getting that mist and the ground fog and there wouldn't be the need for rain again. So I tend to think that will come back into play in the new heavens and the new earth that God's going to be creating when we get on the other side of the millennial kingdom. Mm -hmm. Just, it makes sense to me too. I'll agree with you. <laughs> Okay, back so to Genesis. No rain or there is rain in the millennium. In the millennium, there is still rain. There's still, there's rain. still rain, and there's a need for rain so that they can, you know, have their crops, their food, and all that they need. People get the wrong idea, and I know I sure grew up with this and had to fight it as I grew up to realize my my thinking was not right. You want to picture the millennial earth as perfect. Everything's wonderful. Well, read about the beginning of the millennium when they're still burying dead bodies and they're still cleaning the land and they're still burning the implements of war. That goes on for a number of months. Right away in the beginning, it's showing us it's not a perfect and a restored. It is better, it gets better, but again, they're still going into um, the everyday lives of the people who'll be living it's still the earth. It's, it needs to be cleaned up because of what it went through in the tribulation. Mm -hmm. But it's not suddenly perfect. Suddenly perfect comes in the new heavens and the new earth that the Lord will create that he refers to in Revelation 21 and 22. So have to wait a little bit longer. Millennium is definitely better than tribulation. Far better. <laughs> but they're going to need rain. They're going to need to make, you know, uh, plant crops harvest, all of that. There's still going to be going on. Okay, going back to Genesis 1, I think we're ready for verse 8. 8 says, God called the expanse heaven. If you have a capital H, oops, I you shouldn't. <laughs> I knew you did. That's why some of the newer translations have changed it. It's talking about the atmospheric heaven. It's not talking about God's heaven. Okay? This heaven that's being described here is the atmosphere. Remember, we've got our three heavens mentioned in Scripture. In fact, let me give you those verses now because we've talked about them a couple times. Oh, it's not supposed to be a capital. It shouldn't be a capital because it's not referring to God's heaven. Oh, okay. Let me show you, okay? The atmospheric heavens of clouds, when we're talking about where the clouds are in Scripture, that's Jeremiah 4.25. Look with me in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 25. 
Jeremiah 4 and verse 25. I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. Okay, I thought it had clouds there, sorry. But that's the birds of the heavens, okay? Where the birds are, that's one level. Okay, I think we all know when there's no class now. So let's put this down because I know last time we got, we had a hard time with it. So, three heavens, one is where the birds are, where the birds fly. Okay, our second heaven referred to in scripture is the starry heavens where the stars are. I think you all agree with me, the birds aren't landing on the stars out there, are they? They're landing on our treetops, they're landing on our buildings, they're not going all the way up to the nearest star. They're, they're far lower. The stars in, in the constellations and all that, Isaiah 13.10. So I'm just going to put stars, etc. That's the second heaven. The first heaven is right above us, it's what we're breathing, and it's where the birds fly, it's where the planes fly to. Okay? Second heaven is the starry constellations, Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10. Come on, tablet. Isaiah 13 and verse 10. And we are going to read, For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. This is during the tribulation period, but you notice how it calls it the stars of heaven. Okay? So, you've got your birds, now you've got your stars, and then you have the place with God's throne. This is the one that I would give the capital H to Loretta. Okay. God's throne deserves a capital H. Okay? And these are heaven with a small h, this is second heaven, this is first heaven, um, oops, Isaiah 13, 10. The planets are in the second heaven. <laughs> the planets, yeah, stars, planets, yes, all of this is your second heaven, then the third heaven is God's heaven, and we're going to see that referred to, let's go to Hebrews 9:24. Hebrews 9.24. Hebrews is a very good book written by a Jewish boy to Jewish people. It's great for understanding. There's so much richness in there. I love the book of Hebrews. I love the whole Bible. Verse 24. If I read it from my complete Jewish Bible, it says, For the Messiah has entered a holiest place which is not man-made. It's merely a copy of the true one. So when we see the tabernacle or the temple on earth, and we call, talk about the holy, holiest place there, when scripture talked about Messiah with his blood going through and putting his blood on the holiest place that was not made with hands, it was the one that earth was patterned after. Obviously, he's gone into God's heaven, and it says it as I continue reading. But he went into heaven itself in order to appear now on our behalf in the very presence of God. Wow. That's the third heaven. That's the one that I can't wait to get to. Amen. But I have news for you. Once I'm there, bad English, but I ain't coming back. <laughs> I'm home and I'm staying home. I love home. <laughs> okay, let me give you another verse and then we'll talk about the third heaven also. This should pop in your minds, hopefully, for those of you who know your scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Anyone know who wrote Corinthians? Was it Paul? Very good. It was Paul. So you know who's talking. But the reason why I wanted that in your mind is he says in verse 2, I know a man in Messiah, in Christ, who about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Okay, what's he saying? The one who's writing this is saying, I had an out-of-body experience. At least I think it was out-of-body. I don't think it was just a vision. I I don't know which way it was, but all of a sudden I was in God's heaven. Okay? He was in God's heaven. Notice what he called it though. He called it the third heaven. That's how we get first, second, and third. He called it the third heaven. Verse 4 tells us a little bit more. Was caught up. 
he, the one who was talking, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. I want to know what he heard. I want to know what he saw. I want him to tell me I'm so excited about what my home must be like. I can't wait. And I want to know it. But, you know, God only lets us know so much. Gives us enough to know to be all excited. But we haven't a clue yet. So he made it very clear. It's where God is. It's where his throne is. It's called paradise. And I have news for you. Paradise isn't down here. Yeah. And paradise isn't even oh, here. No, it's Jesus. got to be all the way up in the third heaven. So this is our paradise. Now, lest someone get confused, and I don't want to go into the whole teaching now, but let me just say quickly, when you hear that word paradise, somebody's going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I heard the Lord tell the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. And you've taught that paradise wasn't up there. Right. But by the time Paul was writing, paradise was up there right. because the change came when the Lord resurrected. Then he emptied out paradise from the heart of the earth and took it up to the third heaven, made the way through Satan's atmosphere so that we, following in that same pathway, make it from earth to heaven safely. I am the way. I am the truth. truth I am the life. <laughs> I love it. I can't wait to go. <laughs> Again, it's like a three-year-old being told all about Disneyland. They're so excited because they're going to get to see their cartoon characters, and they're yeah. going to get to go on rides, and they're going to get to eat ice cream. And, you know, Mommy every day tells this three-year-old, you know, every time the, the three-year-old's going to sleep at night, you know, in four more days, in three more days, in two more days. Well, we're hanging on that in the last moments. We don't have a day. We don't have a thousand years. We don't have a day. But we're hanging on. And I think our understanding of what heaven is like is about equal to that three-year-old really understanding what Disneyland is like. Mm -hmm. All we know is it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be out of this world. That's why it's found out of this world. Mm -hmm. But that's what's being promised to us. And that is so exciting that, yes, I can hardly wait to be able to strip off this body that, that, that ties me to earth via gravity, that holds me here, that keeps me from soaring through outer space in the new that, that God is, will turn us all into. The mortality puts on immorality, the mortality, the corruption puts on incorruption. We've got our new bodies that can go through the heavens, go into God's heaven. Ah. And no more aches, no more pains, <laughs> no more sciatic nerves, no more hard of hearing, no go. more cancer. You <laughs> name it, that's gone. Yeah, Who yeah. can't get excited over that? And no one calling you, please pray, and they're crying and crying. No more tears. <laughs> no more tears, no more heartaches, no more heartbreaks. That's what's good, right? Yes. That's what's awaiting us. But we got to come back down to earth because we're studying how God created the earth. So <laughs> we we're going to come back down, but that's our, our heavens. So when it's talking now in Genesis 1 and verse 9, when it's speaking of the heaven here, it's not speaking of God's heaven. It doesn't give us any reason to picture his throne, to picture what we know is paradise. Now that's not what's being talked about here. We're talking about in relation to the earth. So... Verse 9, let the waters below the heavens be gathered in a one place. Okay, we've talked about the canopy in the heavens. That's below the third heaven. That would be in, in our first and even before we get to the second heaven, really. Now we're going to talk about the water that's below. So if it's below, we're talking about the water that's been over the face of the earth. Remember, we know that that water was all over the face of this earth from the earlier verses. So... Now we're going to look at that water being gathered into one place. And apparently, from understanding this, what we have to realize is the waters have covered the dry land. The idea I get from that is that the dry land was there first. 
So the dry land isn't something new, it's something that's going to be able to be seen now. It's coming into view again, and it gives us the idea that the dry land was all um, one. It was all connected. We look at dry land today, and I wish, well, I don't think Roger could spin the camera, but right behind me, for those of you in the classroom, is a picture of our world. And we see different continents. We see a lot of water in between. But, well, he can do it. Okay. Although it's too little. But he's working on it. But you all know what it looks like anyway. If he doesn't succeed in getting there, that's okay. You have to turn him but up. we've got seven continents. <laughs> do we not? Yeah. What's between the continents? Water. 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 Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Mediterranean Sea, and goes on and on. Maybe the Med doesn't separate continents, but you know what I'm saying, okay? I'm not trying to teach you geography today. When we look at Genesis chapter 10 and verse 25, we notice something very interesting there that correlates with what we're talking about right now. Again, you don't want anything that's just Rochelle's idea. You want scripture. There we go. Okay. For any who needed to see it, there's our seven continents and a whole lot of water. Okay. Now, Genesis 10, 25 says, Two sons were born to Eber. Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. That sounds like the earth was all one. And if my math taught me right, when you divide, now you've got two, three, four, you've got divisions. I think that's when our seven continents started to come into play, was in the days of Peleg. How now, traumatic would that have been? And that that they named their child after that. You know, I taught a girl who was named Stormy, born on a stormy night. <laughs> okay? But yes, how dramatic, how amazing, how, wow, what caused that? Was there a huge, well, it didn't say earthquake, but what caused it to split? Now, if you know your plate tectonics today, and again, I'm not here to be scientific and tell you it like a scientist can tell you, but I know enough to understand that when I was taught in school, if you took our continents like a jigsaw puzzle and you pushed them all back together, they pretty much come together to form one. You can see, even though there's been some slippage this way and this way and that way, you can see how it all fit together at once. So when we're talking about the dry land back here in Genesis 1 now, I believe that we're talking about all in one area. And the waters are going to be around that area. You're going to have the land may be pushing up, the waters may be seceding and going down. However God's doing it, we're now getting a mass called dry land appearing and the rest water. All those waters are, are being you know, pushed into other areas. And we know that the waters eventually are going to, going to be oceans and seas and rivers and, and all of that. But at this point, we're just kind of pushing the waters out of the way and the land is appearing. Okay, and that's why it says in Genesis 1, and I've got to go back there, why it says, the way it says it again, being very specific, and let the dry land appear. So you don't hear, I'm creating the dry land, do you? You don't hear him even say here, I made the dry land. <coughs> creating out of nothing, out of the question. Made doesn't sound right. Appearing sounds the same thing, like, okay, it's being brought in into some way now that we're able to see it. We're able to recognize it. So it sounds very much like the, the land already existed. And it's singular, not plural. And it's singular, not plural, because it was one mass, one land. So did and it that evaporate? would. Did the water evaporate? No, it got pushed aside. Oh. It pushed aside into the oceans, you know, with the depth of the oceans and all that. It's, it's, and maybe, maybe even besides a side down so that the land came up and the waters went down. I don't know how God did it. That's a good question to ask when we get there. <laughs> but this gives room for what we believe, again, in between Genesis 1-1 one, one and 1-2, one, that the earth was dry land. It had the, the beautiful uh, stones on its surface. And now with the water judgment that's come, and with the dry land coming up out of that, the changes that have taken place, like Pastor Frederick used to like to say, it sounds like God turned earth inside out. And now 
what was on the outside went in, what was on the inside came out. So now we've got the, the dry land that we see, but where do we find those jewels? We have to mine for them, we have to dig for them, we have to go in toward the heart of the earth. We never get to the heart of the earth, but we, we work our way toward it. So it all fits. It all comes together. And that's what we want to do with scripture. You don't want to take one verse and build your whole theory or, or your belief. You want to see it go, um, other scriptures agree with it. And then you, you're pretty well sure that you're on that right track. So, it sounds good. I think we have it. We have our dry land that has appeared, and verse 10 tells us that God called the dry land Earth. That's how we get the name Earth. We didn't name this globe Earth. God named it Earth. That's important because later we're going to see a different name. The gathering of the waters he called seas. Okay, He didn't call them oceans and rivers and all that. He called them seas at this point. S-E-A-S, not seas, candy that you eat. <laughs> and not that he sees with his eyes. This is S-E-A-S, seas, okay? So God's made all the waters um, gathered into one place. The dry land has appeared. He's called uh, it earth. He's called it seas. And the end of verse 10, and God saw that it was good. Okay, God gives a stamp of approval well, on it. Verse 10, we just finished verse 10. God saw that it was good. Okay, and we're going to talk about that phrase, and it was good in just a little bit when we're comparing it to something else also. Verse 11 tells us, then God said, he's going on and creating. Remember, in about 30 verses, we're getting six days of creation. Now what's he creating, it says, or making, or bringing into our view. Um, I need to be clear. Then God said, verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind, with seed in them, and it was so. Now, it doesn't say that God made the trees the way that it says it in the Hebrew. Let me find my paper that's got all the different. Okay, the different Hebrew words, in, in verse 1 we saw Barak created out of nothing. In verse 2 we saw Hayah, that it became without form and void, and we saw the root of that word was Yahi. In verse 3, what he talked about in verse 3, when we look back in verse 3, the light, that's right, the light and the darkness was still the, the yahi, the aha, something that was coming to pass, coming into view. Verse 11 now, sprouting, is another Hebrew word. This word is dasha, D-A-S-H-A in our English. I'll put it over here. D-A-S-H-A, but you pronounce it da. <coughs> Shaw, rhyming word, okay? So that word is to sprout, to grow, okay? So we're seeing a growth is now, th th these trees, everything that's being named is going to grow now, okay? So again, were trees there before? It, it could be. It sounds quite possibly like there were. There is evidence in Ezekiel chapter 31 that... It's either just language that is, um, oh, what do you call language? Um, simile. What do you call, not simile, oh my word. It's a basic word. Um, when you can't take it literally, it's figurative. There's another word for that, figurative language. Okay. Ezekiel 31 talks about the trees going down to Sha'ol. Now, is figurative language definitely talking about kings, the king of Egypt and other kings. But there might be a double play there. And it could be that at the time of the change that some of the trees were taken away. We do know for a fact you don't find the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on this earth anymore. You don't find a place where there's the Garden of Eden and the angels are, are guarding you know, the, the entry so that no one can get in and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Furthermore, we know there's a tree up in heaven. Metaphorical? That'll work. Metaphor. Metaphor. How do you spell that? Good enough. How do you spell metaphor? M-E-T-A-P-H-O-R. -E. She's a good speller. <laughs> I spell terrible. Sure. Isn't it? I don't think so. I don't okay. think there's any on there. Say that again. M-E-T-A-P-H-O-R. 
P-H, oops, <laughs> I, may be, I may be able to spell it, but I can't write it. M-E-T-A-P-H-O-R. That's when, you know, like, like when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was compared to a tree and he was going to be cut down. It wasn't the end of his life, but that tree was a picture. It was a metaphor. Okay, Ezekiel 31 is definitely a metaphor. It's definitely talking about Egypt. It's talking about other head leaders and where they ended up. A number of the verses. I don't remember exactly where, but I, it may be something like start with verse 11 and go through verse 16. I may be a little off, you know, but somewhere around in there. Okay, but my point is it may also have another. It may be telling us something else because when you read Ezekiel 34, 31, I'm sorry, with Isaiah 14, remember when we read about Satan falling from heaven? We read about his judgment that we think this earth was his kingdom and it was judged at the same time that he was he entered into his judgment, the fullness of which, the completeness of which will be later, but we see it starting. Um, in that same way, when you read Ezekiel 31, you're going to say, is this really talking about the king of Egypt or is this talking about Satan and about his fall? And I'm not here to tell you dogmatically which way because I can't. But you read it for yourself and see what you think. But we definitely know that we see metaphor in Scripture. And I, I got waylaid in saying up in heaven, Revelation 21, in, when we're in heaven, we're eating from the, the tree that gives a different fruit every month, different fruit in the season. We, so we know there's trees in heaven. It sounds like there are trees taken into the heart of the earth. If so, I believe it would have happened at the time of that judgment. If not then, at the time of Noah, but I tend to think it happened before that. Rhonda has a question. You need to unmute yourself. And if I had your hand up for an hour, I apologize. <laughs> She's trying hard. Can you help her? There you go. Okay, I'm wanting clarification. Okay. Was the earth, was the earth judged when Satan arrived or when Adam and Eve sinned or when Noah and, you know, when Noah? Is that what caused the land to break up? Which, which one caused the land to we're not told what caused the land to break up. That happened in the days of Peleg, which is after Noah. So the, the, days, the days when the continents started drifting apart, we don't know what caused that, but we are told it happened in, in Peleg's day, and Peleg is after Noah. Um, read Genesis 10, you get the genealogy there. I don't remember all the names to go back up, working up backwards, but you'll see that it's after Noah's time. The first judgment that I believe this earth had that we know of, what's recorded for us, I believe was before Adam was put on this earth. It happened between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. The second world judgment that we know of or read about in relation to our earth, what we call our earth, is in Noah's day when the flood covered the face of the earth. God promised then, I won't judge this earth again with a flood. Now he could say that from the first time. He could just say it because he did it to Noah. But it makes even more sense if he's saying it because he judged it once from Satan, from Satan having it being his kingdom. And then he judged it in Noah's day in the same way. And he knows mankind's going to continue to get as bad again as they were in the days of Noah. And he's saying, but I'm not going to judge it by water. That's when I'll bring the fire. And he'll, he'll let it dissolve. And we have finally our new heavens and our new earth. But in between Noah, very close in comparison to Noah, and the, the earth that's going to dissolve read, that we read about in Second Peter 3, that would be when the continents started coming separate, that would be in the days of Peleg, and that's all we're told. And we read it Genesis 10, 25, but you'll get who he's the son of, the son of, the son of, the son of, in Genesis 10 there. And when we get there, we'll talk about it again. Okay? Okay. Sure. Any other questions? My husband's going to flip when I get home tonight and tell him about that. 
<laughs> about the earth separating? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We've got a husband that's going to go flippers. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so we're back to verse 11, and we now have the trees that are here sprouting. They're bringing new life. Okay. We don't know for a fact whether it was original creation now or not, but it doesn't sound like it because it's a different Hebrew word. Verse 16, to give you the comparison real quickly, verse 16, God made, okay, that word when we have God made is asah, A-S-A-H, that's not the one I wrote up here, I wrote dasha, okay, that's verse 16, jump down to verse 25, verse 25 we have, and we won't get to this in the same in the same day, obviously. But verse 25, God made the beasts of the earth. Again, that's a sock. That's 16 and 25 are both the same. We've already talked about Barah in verse 1, and we'll see Barah come at, again in verse 27, created out of nothing. But right here in the middle of all of that, in verse 11, we have this sprouting. Okay, It's fruit tree bearing. It's yielding fruit after its kind. So we definitely have a, a, a newness of life come on, and it will go through the process of life. It's going to, to bear life. Um, oh, and, and by the way, I told you Isaiah 14. Remember Ezekiel 28 also talked about Satan's fall, those two chapters, reading that with Ezekiel 31 in mind too. What we're seeing here, what I want to bring out to you here, is there's no evolution of vegetation. Okay, the vegetation, each is bearing after its own kind. Who made the vegetation? And why would there be such a variety if it just happened? If it's coming together by an evolutionary process and it just happens, then how do we just happen to have it very often? Let's just look at the trees. Why does one become an oak tree? And why does one become a, um, a palm tree? Those are two you can definitely see the difference of. And furthermore, if it's the evolutionary process, why doesn't the palm tree eventually become something else? Why doesn't the oak tree eventually become something else? But an oak tree always gives birth, so to speak, to oak trees, and the palm tree to palm trees, kind after its kind. There's a lot of room for variety in there. How many kinds of trees? How many kinds of flowers? We'll get there, but how many varieties of people? We all look different. We all have different faces and features, but we all have two eyes, nose, and mouth. <laughs> We're all human, and we produce human kind. Okay? It gives absolutely no room for evolution. It just is not there. You do not see it. And anything that they try to tell you in, the, in nature that they have found that shows you a crossover has been proven to be false. Yeah. I even remember when I was in high school, there were some kids in England that put something together, I don't remember how, but it was found and the people jumped on it, the scientists jumped on it, they said, we've got our first half bird, half man, and for about two weeks, everybody was talking about it. It was headlines, it was all over, you know, the, the missing link, they had found it, and in about two weeks, it came out that they were, it was these three university-aged kids who had done something themselves. It wasn't as old as they were saying. It wasn't a combination. They had pulled a big hoax, and the scientists were believing it. Hello. I won't say anymore. What I will say is, on the basis of this verse, I think we know very clearly the answer to the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> and uh, God doesn't lay no eggs, and he doesn't sit on them to hatch, so I think we know the chicken came first. We have plants that were fully mature, ready to yield seed, to give fruit. And again, plenty of variation within the kind. Look at all the dogs we have. You've got little chihuahuas and you've got big great danes. You've got skinny little and you've yeah. got fat. Yeah. <laughs> you take it to any animal, take it to the fishies in the ocean, take it to everything God's created. God loves variety. He doesn't carbon copy anything, but he doesn't give room for the evolutionary process of it changing from one species into another. Furthermore, many of the plants and trees require pollination by insects. Insects weren't created till the sixth day. 
So God brought them full, ready to produce, not needing to be pollinated in the beginning so that they could be giving life. If there's a long age in between, if we've got the geological ages here, then there are many flowers and trees, etc., that should have died off before the insects that they need for their life ever were formed. But if it's a couple of days, there's no problem whatsoever. God did it all, did it in order, put it into a process that we can see and watch. What all we learn from nature is fascinating. But you'll never learn anything that will prove evolution. Do I sound like a broken record? <laughs> I probably do. Um, I see our time is fast running out. Let me tie it up. Let me show you very quickly verse 12. Where am I? I am, I'm in Genesis 1. Okay, verse 12. <clears throat> the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Okay, we've got that. But it's interesting because if we go back up a little earlier, we see in verse 10, God saw that it was good. He said it twice in the same day. This is day three his, the, that he's creating, and he said it twice. It was good, and it was good. Because of this, Orthodox Jews to this day still want to be married on Tuesdays because they believe Tuesday is the third day, and they want to be married on the day that God blessed twice so that their marriage will be blessed twice. <laughs> that really is what their thinking is. And I even saw a wedding take place in Israel on a Tuesday by an Orthodox family. I, uh, we were the uninvited guests. <laughs> we weren't part of it. Why yes, does that say that? Where does it say what? Uh, that it was good twice. It says it in verse 10. Did? At the end of 10, and God saw that it was good. Uh -huh. And then keep going, and now we see it in verse 12. And God saw that it was oh, good. And, and we're we still in the, the same thing. Because... Because verse 8 tells us when God called the expanse heaven, the evening and the morning were the second day. Okay? Now verse 13 tells us there was evening and there was morning a third day. So everything that happened between the end of 8 and the beginning of 13 is what, what God created on the third day. So everything we've talked about today, the waters gathered in one place, the dry land appearing, the dry land being called earth, the waters being called seas, God said it was good, then the earth is to sprout vegetation, plants and trees, bearing fruit after their kind with their seed in them to continue, um, seed after seed, bearing fruit in the same kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning was the third day. So our third day is blessed twice, the land and the, the trees and plants and, and all of that. Okay, where we're going to leave it off is verse 14. Now we're going to finally get our sun and our moon and our stars are going to come into play. Okay, the first three days were definitely light and darkness, but they're not talking about our sun, moon, and stars. We're going to find out were the sun, moon, and stars created now or did they become visible now? What happened? What word is used in Hebrew to give us an indication for them? You're going to have to come back in two weeks for oh. the answer to that question. <laughs> I love cliffhangers, make you want to come back. <laughs> but uh, we'll look into very much what the darkness and the light and all of that, what it's meaning, the division of the days and the nights, the Hebrew narrative to that. Some of it we've already talked about that it will help solidified in our minds that we are seeing and we're letting scripture interpret scripture and we're staying with what scripture says we're not coming up concocting our own ideas on our own really that's where we get into trouble when man thinks on his own instead of using the word of god for his guide then he comes up with something like evolution or other things also um, i'll read it again later but i love this the account of creation is not a pencil of a painter but it's the pen of a historian. What we have is historical fact penned for us. And it was penned by man who was being led by the Spirit of God to write what was written so that every word is inerrant and infallible. And that is our God. I love it. <laughs> Give God a hand. <laughs> he is awesome and amazing. Amen.
Hey. <laughs> Go for it, Loretta. <laughs> All I can do is shout with joy, remember? <laughs> but okay. I any questions, comments? Yes, Pat. Just a comment. When you they're talking about the fruit of bearing different fruits of every month. First thing popped in my mind was the month of fruit of the month of the, of the club. You know, every month they, this club would give you different fruit. Right. So that's the first yeah. thing popped in my mind. <laughs> and maybe fruit they of the got month club. Fruit, and, of, fruit of the month club. And maybe they got that idea from scripture. Because if you go read in the end, you will see that it talks about every month there would be a different fruit. But, you know, notice what man has to do to create something else. Like your berries especially, your raspberries and, you know, all of those. Those are cross pollinations. There are two that have been brought together, the blackberry being in two different combinations from the raspberry and so forth and so on. But there's still berries. There's still berries. You don't ever get out of what it is. Okay? And you can put a dog and a cat together and you don't get a, a mouth. <laughs> you get dogs producing dogs and cats producing cats and, and people don't produce other things either. It's just God has got an order. He's put it into motion. It, it follows after its kind. What can we say? But uh, it'd be interesting to go on and see what else God created. We're actually moving along though um, because it was a while back when I read you the pictures, the typology, the metaphors of the four days of creation in relation to our Messiah's work for us. I'll bring that back also, but we got to get through day four first. So that's coming, but it helps us to hear it over and over and over again. So all that will be in two weeks. I hope I made you good and hungry, but I hope right now you're full. Go keep feeding yourself. Go see what you can discover. See if you can find out. Did he create the sun, the moon, and the stars at this time? Is that the word from the Hebrew? See what you can find out. You all be so smart, you won't need me as teacher anymore. Uh. <laughs> but I still hope you'll come back. <laughs> okay? Again, any more questions, comments, Zoom room? I'm looking at you. Everybody's quiet. And you can tell them, Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, Blessed Thanksgiving. <laughs> Remember, come back for Hanukkah on December 4th. See, see me for details. It is pork. a potluck. <laughs> Don't bring pork. It's a lot of fun. Does anyone know someone who is a pianist? I thought I had a pianist and I need a pianist for that day. Does anyone know a pianist? For, uh -oh. for the what? For, the fourth? for Hanukkah, for the fourth. Yeah. I have a piano, but I will not claim to be, you know, the make a joyful noise thing. Yeah, that's how I play piano too. Okay, pray with me that I find a pianist because uh, that is a need. Call Irma because she said her son was going to be here, but I don't know when. He does and guitar. He we could we could do with guitar too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if you want to or not, but yeah. just <coughs> somebody who can lead. Yeah, they don't I have to have you know, a simple Jewish tune. Um, and it's okay. one song that everybody's familiar she with. It's not days, what we do, but it's the tune of Twelve Days of Christmas. So we do the Eight Days of Hanukkah. Oh wow! How cool is that? It's fun. You gotta come. It'll be uh, everything will be new for you. Good, good. You will love it. Well, you will love it. Well, and at the same time, you'll get fit. Yeah, she will. And I don't mean physically. It. I mean spiritually. <laughs> I enjoy it. have a thing at my church that day. Oh, but it's later. Oh, good. We'll pray for extra energy. And you can you can come and go. You don't have to do the work end. You know, just come and go. Okay. Um, Dave is back. Got to hear the joke in light of Hanukkah because I'm sure you, it's gonna click off a memory for you. What did the one pig say to the other? I wish the whole world were Jewish. <laughs> we said that early on when we talked about no ham or pork at our December Hanukkah celebration. So if you don't remember, Dave, I'll remind you later. But I have a feeling your mind, uh, <laughs> you remember. I'm looking for a nod. Maybe you don't. You do remember. How about that? Cool. Okay, everybody else is curious, but anyway, <laughs> you have to know me for a few more years. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Anyone? Everybody's good? Okay. Oh, our Creator God, you are awesome and you are amazing in your creation, showing your handiwork just our minds are exploding or imploding or both at the same time. 
but we thank you because you show us how magnanimous you are, how majestic you are, how creative you are, how powerful you are, and then you show us your tender loving care, that your eye sees every human on this earth, as we read in the opening in Psalm 33, that you see us, you're aware of us, you know our needs, you hear before we even cry what we are going to cry, and you send us answers before we even ask. We are so blessed. Lord, help us to trust in you no matter our circumstances because you've given us no reason to ever doubt or to ever fear. You are the perfect God who cares perfectly for his sheep. Thank you that we can call you the, the chief shepherd, that we are your little sheep. And as sheep are dumb and need a shepherd, Lord, thank you that uh, you take care of us. Lord, bless each and every one. May they have a good time apart with their families in celebration for Thanksgiving or with friends. But Lord, thank you. We can look forward if we don't get caught up first to coming back together and continuing to learn. Thank you for the privilege of studying your word. Thank you that I, I can pray and ask you bless each one within my hearing in a very special way because you love them even more than anyone else ever could. Thank you, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Blessed Thanksgiving.